Welcome back to the PIC microcontroller series that I started back in January, I think. I'm sorry for the amount of time it's taken me to record uh, episode 3. It's basically because I had some problems with my PIC programming hardware, and so I had to get all, all of that fixed. I've actually ordered a new uh, programming board by Microelectronica, and or it's probably micro electronica and hopefully that's going to come soon and basically that should hopefully avoid some of the problems that i've had with the mp lab ide with various bugs and things that are still i think quite disappointing because it seem to be problems that everybody else has and don't seem to get fixed but anyway in the first video we looked at an introduction to a PIC microcontroller so microchip are a company PIC is a trademark and PIC is really microchips type of microcontroller. There are lots of similarities between different microcontrollers. They essentially are designed to do the same job, but the instruction sets are kind of different between the different manufacturers and the price points are different. The functionality is slightly different. So you kind of have to choose which ones you want to use. And, you know, most people tend to stick with the same ones because obviously once you've learned them, then it's much easier for you to use them. But the PIC microcontrollers are a good value for money, I think. Good way of uh, learning how to use a microcontroller. And effectively, it's a single board computer, a very small, very simple uh, controller, effectively. So I can program outputs, I can read inputs, I can do various basic things with those. But actually, with some of the larger devices, have a lot of memory, have a lot of functionality, and some of them even have built-in functionality like say CAN bus or serial controllers or LAN controllers or you know things like that that might be useful for the application that you're using. In the second video we looked at a very simple way of turning on an output and so we saw that in assembly and we saw that in C and uh, we're going to do the same thing I mean as far as I can I'm going to try and use C and assembly in all of these examples and that's just because assembly is very useful for designing systems where the timing is critical so any type of bus controller communication protocol anything where you don't have a standalone controller that, that does it for you you will need to set the timing up in assembly and as we learned in assembly before each assembly instruction tends to take two clock cycles uh, except for the any branching ones like call and go to which take four so because that's kind of a constant you can work out from your clock speed how long each line is going to take and if timing's critical you've even got something called no op which basically says use up two clock cycles but don't do anything so that can enable you to space out some of your code so that the timing is correct so assembly is very useful even though C is a higher level language than assembly and it's kind of easier to use in lots of ways but it does hide that extra detail from you which can be a problem just so that you know you can mix the two together you can have a, a C program like this and you could get to a certain point and say um, you know I want to do some assembly in here like you know no op or mop, no op and you know that kind of stuff so you can mix the two, but we're just going to keep them separate for the time being. And let's look now at how to read an input. So you can see here in the webcam, this is live, hello, um, that I have a board set up here. I have three buttons. I'm using the middle button, which is connected to RA4, so port A, bit 4. And you can see the light that comes on at the top of the board up here, which is RB2. So that's an output. They just happen to be connected to whatever ports uh, microchip decided to connect them to. So there's no particular logic to use uh, B2 and A4. That's just how this board is wired up. And so what we do in C, which is very, very easy, we've looked before at the main entry point for the program. That's a C thing. So that's where control is going to start. First thing is I'm going to call the init function, which... Uh, doesn't return anything doesn't take any parameters and in this case it's simply going to set port b to all zeros so port b is going to be all outputs 
I'm um, sorry, this is actually the data in port B. So I'm just going to zero port B so that if I then set this to an output, it doesn't suddenly switch on. So sorry to confuse you there. This is how we set uh, B2 to be an output. And the good thing about C is I can do that very easily um, with just a one liner because I can work at a bit level and C takes care of how that works under the covers. Uh, and then for A4, A4 is the input for the button. So again, you notice that's Tris B bits, that's Tris A bits. And then I can access each one individually, zero, one, that's easy. And then once that's done, it will come back to here, sit in the while loop. And you might think, well, surely one is always gonna be true. And that's exactly the point is, as we mentioned before, the programs in the microcontroller have to keep going. If that finishes here, then, the processor will just stop. It won't reset. It won't do anything useful. And most of the time, you don't want that. Most of the time, you want it to sit there running the program forever. And then all this does here is it basically assigns the input RA4 directly to the output RB2. Now, you might notice there's a little inverter. And the only reason I've done that is because the inputs on this board, as they are probably in most boards, are wired to be active low. That means that when I press the button, the input on the chip goes to zero, not to a one, as you might expect it to. It's not like turning on a light. Um, when you press the button, it grounds the pin, which makes you go to zero. Uh, there's kind of reasons for that, which we don't need to get into. But if we look at the circuit diagram, this is a bit of a low resolution copy, but hopefully you can see the idea. So this is one of the switches that's normally open. So when that switch is open, which means it's not pressed, then this resistor ensures that the line is set to a one by taking uh, the five volt supply VCC and takes that into the input. And then when you press the button, then this effectively grounds this line to make it go down to a zero. And because that resistor is much lower than this resistor, then effectively the current from here won't push it back up to a one all that will happen is that current will go down here as well, just a very small amount. So that's kind of the gist of it. You'll need to kind of understand that when you start building circuits, because especially if you're using a board like I am, you can see in the webcam, then then you need to know obviously which way around they are. Otherwise, you're going to get very confused like I did last night when I tried this out. So anyway, I've got two projects open. The assembly one is project four. We're in project five. So first, we're just going to build it, make sure it builds OK. Uh, note that you do sometimes get warnings up here. So it's worth having a, a quick look, even if it's successful. Check out the warnings. It might kind of tell you something that you've missed. That seems to be OK. So now I'm going to hit program. And you notice now that um, this is obviously going to start the program in. You'll see that it's going to raise and then program the device. And then eventually, after about 10 seconds, it will say that it's complete. Um, you, OK, so that's done now. And you notice sometimes when it's programmed, these lights flash because they're connected to the programming lines, which is why they flash up. So if I now go and I press this button, Notice the LED comes on. If I don't press it, it goes off. If I press it, don't press it, press it, don't press it. Fairly easy. Um, so that demonstrates both the reading of that and the writing directly to an output as well. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing too magical in there. Um, we will see a little trick later on, which will be important. So stay tuned. This is the C version. Let's go back and have a look at assembly. Now, remember the assembly, it looks more complicated because it's very, very low level. Um, so, for instance, you have to use these funny little commands, tell it what the type is, include the relevant ink file. That is one that I've got open here. So that's just got all the definitions in it. And then we have to set these configuration bits. We actually do this in C as well, but we do it in a much neater way in C with this hash pragma setting. But in here, we use underscore underscore config. We tell it to be a crystal oscillator, turn the watchdog off and turn code protection off. The other thing that we mentioned before, which you will come across, I think it's only relevant for old uh, low range picks where for some reason the reset part of the memory wasn't at zero, which meant that if you reset the device, it would start trying to run, you know, something like, you know, zero XFF or some silly place like that. 
So what you have to do in some cases is you have to set a hook to say at this address, go to start, um, which obviously then does everything else and then reset back to the beginning of the program. Now, in this case, the reset vector is zero on this specific device. So I don't need to put this in here, but it's just a good habit. If you make a template out of the file, then it just reminds you to check where your reset vector is for your device. Just one of those strange things that um, you have to think about with a microcontroller. Now, another thing that's an issue on some of these lower end devices is they have multiple banks and they don't have enough bits to select all of the registers. So they split them into, in this case, bank zero and bank one. So the ports, which is the ones you're normally going to use in your program, are in bank zero, which is kind of handy. The ones that you don't tend to access quite so frequently, uh, like the TRIS ones, the tri-state registers, you tend to only set them at the beginning of the program. So they're in bank one. And again, if we go back to this file, it will show you that most of the stuff of any use is in bank zero. And then things like TRIS, which are not used very much. This is the um, e, uh, EEPROM controller stuff. Again, they're settings that you normally set right at the beginning. Uh, and then an option register, which um, is actually, I thought was in both banks, but um, I'm not sure. It might be the status one that's in both banks. So you can see here what's in what bank. And unfortunately, when we're going to assembly, we have to set or clear this RP0 in order to select the bank. So by clearing it, we go into bank zero and then I clear port B, which is that one line there. Then I have to go into bank one by setting this bit. And then remember that you can't put a number directly into file register. So two operations is move a number into the working register, move the working register into the file register. So that's effectively four clock cycles just to do that. Um, I could call a bit clear flag if I wanted to clear a particular bit. Um, depends what you want to do. But in this case, I've just shown you how to do it that way. Um, and the same, just using a binary number instead, we can move a literal into the working register, move that into Tris A, or I could do bit set flag um, Tris A, and then it will be RA4, I think should be defined, hopefully. Yeah, RA4 is set to four. So I could do it that way as well, but you know, wh whichever you can do and then because i'm in a call i've been called i have to return um whereas if i use go to i don't have to return so this is more like a subroutine than just a go to so i return i pass zero i don't use the zero but you just have to um, provide a number there um, at least i think it's um, mandatory so that's the init function so when actually i get to the reset vector it actually calls start which is here start calls in it which we've just looked at then i go back to bank zero here i could um in some ways i probably should do that every time i access port a or port b but in this case they're the only registers i'm accessing so i'm going to set it once up here to go back to bank zero and then i hit my main loop now unfortunately we can't just do things like you know rb2 equals ra4 in assembly uh, just because of the way it all works and in this case if the two bits were the same if that was rb2 and ra2 and i wasn't using any of the other inputs or outputs i could actually copy the number directly over from one port to the other but in this case the bits are different so i kind of need to do it the long way and that introduces this function here this command if we look um back here so you should have some kind of reference set if you find the instructions the, the instructions for your device it will have a page in there of these um, uh, operators of the instruction set and th these ones here if you look at the bit oriented ones you'll notice that apart from clearing and setting one in order to test it we basically use one of these two which are kind of the same the only difference is one of them skips the next instruction if the bit is clear. The other skips the instruction if it's set. So they're kind of the opposite way around. But they do the same job. And what they basically do is, here's my one line. I'm going to test bit four in port A. And in this case, if that bit is clear, 
I'm going to skip the next line and go to the one afterwards. In this case, it's then going to hit a go to, which is immediately afterwards. I don't have to have that. I could just have it drop straight into here, but this just makes it a bit clearer. If it isn't clear, then it's not going to skip it. It's going to call a different go to, and it's going to go to LED on. And as you might imagine, one of them clears the output and goes back to main again. One sets the output, goes back to main, and then it just does the same thing um, again and again forever and ever. Uh, and because we're using go-tos, we don't need the while loop like you have in C. But if you notice, there's quite a lot more code in here to do something very simple as there is in here. But again, it's useful to kind of know this because the more that you use the assembly, the more you'll get used to when you actually get to do the scary stuff with timings and writing to buses and reading data, all the rest of it, then you might have to use assembly. So um, why not learn both at the same time? So I'm going to set my project now to be um, project four, which is this assembly one. I'm just going to build it, make sure that's happy, which it is. And now I'm going to program this. So again, if we watch down here, see the lights flashing a bit as it's programming. And hopefully at some point I'll get the same message down here, which will tell me that the verify is complete. And um, once that's done, hopefully if I press my button, notice it's the other way around on this one. If I press it, it goes off. If I let go, it goes on, off, on, off, on. So that's all fine. And obviously if I wanted to swap it around, um, all I'd have to do is I could change this to an S and then it would be the other way around. So if I do that one as, as well, just to show you, um, LED2, once it's finished, should be off. Uh, programming. Da, 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 da. Verify complete. So notice now that um, this is off. This, I can use my finger, can't I? That's off. But if I press the button, it'll go on. So I've just reversed uh, the sense of it so that's what the btfss and btfsc do it's a bit annoying um, that they do stuff whereas in here you can kind of use if if functions and stuff like that but that's kind kind of the way it is um so what i want to do now is i've kind of shown you that i don't really need to uh, do any more assembly for now so let's go back to um, this and show you the important thing now uh, what I've shown really is uh, something very, very simple, which really just says at any point, get that value, stuff it in there. There's no real timing involved, no real problems with that. But let's um, change this slightly. And let's say that I want to have um, uh, a toggle function. So actually what I want to do is every time I press the button, I want the LED to go on or off or on or off. So in order to do that, I need to remember what the last value of it was because I only care about it when it's changed. So let's start by setting that to zero. And inside my while loop, so remember I still need to keep going forever, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say if port A bits are a four, so this is our input. If the input is not equal to last bit, which is this one here. So in other words, it's changed then what I want to do is I want to toggle the value of RB2. So instead of taking it straight from the input, I'm just gonna say, if it was a one, it's now a zero. If it was a zero, it's now a one. And because I've now remembered, um, because I've now done the change, I now need to say, right, last bit equals port A bits RA4. So then it's not gonna change until um i let go of the button or press it again whatever and then when it changes the next time around it do the same thing toggle the led and um and remember it so i th think i've done all that right so let's just um, build that uh, that looks fine and write it to the device and this is where we need to look carefully so what should happen is when i i'm going to press and hold the button so when I press it the first time, this code is going to trigger and go, oh, it's changed. So the LED in this case looks like it's going to go off. When I then let go, it's going to change again and the LED is going to go on. In fact, every time I press it, it's going to look like um, the last example. So I press it and it goes off. I let go and it goes on. 
so that looks like we haven't really done anything special i could obviously modify it so it only changes when i press the button not when i let go but i just want you to watch a second so at the minute if i press it goes off let go it goes on but what happens if i kind of do it a few times i'm going to end up there it's off and i'm not pressing it so do you remember when it when we first programmed it that led was on and when i pressed it it went off and when i let go it went on and when i pressed it it went off and when i let go it went on so why is that led off now and uh, there's a very simple answer to that, and it's something that you have to be very, very, very careful about in electronics generally, but especially when you're working with a microcontroller that's running at really high speed. And the problem is basically that a switch, when you press it or let go, it doesn't just go from zero to one straight away, but there's a tiny, tiny piece of time when the switch, we call it bouncing. So let's say the, uh, if I put my fingers there, contacts are closed and in our, in our head, we think it just kind of goes open, closed, open, closed. But what actually happens is as you open it, it kind of bounces a little bit and then opens. And the same when you close it, touches and, uh, and we're talking about a tiny, tiny little gap, but it's enough with a microcontroller running at a million cycles a second. The microcontroller is going to see that and it's going to read it as pressing the button lots of times. And if it happens to press and release before this comes around to the next cycle um, to check for the bit, then what's going to happen is what we see here. So what we need to do is we need to debounce the switch. And it's something that you can do either electronically. So let's say this is the, I've got it here, I think. This is the schematics. At the minute, there's no circuitry in here to help debounce. So we can do it in a couple of ways. We can add a capacitor. And what effectively that does is it provides a bit of time for the uh, voltage to rise when the switch gets let go. And it's uh, when you press it, it takes a little bit more time to drop. So it effectively smooths out the contacts bouncing. Um, you can actually buy uh, micro, um, a chip which is a debouncing chip, which effectively uses transistors and Darlington drivers and stuff like that to make sure that the switch operations happens very quickly. Um, or the other thing is you can do it in software. So effectively, what we would need to do in software is we would need to say, um, if the bits changed, then we actually need to hold the program until we can see that the output has changed once the output's changed then we can go back to checking it again so um, i'm not going to write the code at the minute but just that was just a little thing to remember when um, when you're programming microcontrollers that it's not always as simple as reading a bit and it works these are the sorts of problems that you might see and you think what on earth's going on what, what have i done wrong but it's nothing to worry about the very simple truth is um, programming a microcontroller is just as much about electronics as it is about programming. So you will need some basic electronics knowledge if you're going to start building these prototype circuits. And even if you've got a pre-built board like I have, you get problems like that. It's good to understand what might be going on, why the light's not behaving um, as it should. But what we're going to do in the next uh, video is we're going to start looking at timers. So timers are very heavily used in microcontrollers. Some devices have one timer, some have eight. You know, they've got different numbers of timers and you can do all kinds of different stuff with them. But again, unfortunately, as you're probably not very surprised about, the timers don't quite work uh, in a simple way. The main problem is they count up too quickly. So we have to scale them and kind of do all sorts of tricks if we're trying to have um, delays of more than a, a 100 microseconds or whatever. So we're going to look at that in the next video. But again, hopefully um, you're going to get yourself a book. You're going to be working through some of the examples. And these videos will just help you get a bit of a taste for as we build up um, our programming skills and our programming library. We'll learn more and more and more things. And then hopefully by the end of it, we'll be programming some really quite advanced stuff, both directly, but also using libraries that you can download as well. 
So thanks very much for listening. Questions and comments, please, at the bottom. Otherwise, I shall see you in the next video.